a long-standing tradition in Judaism of people arguing with each other. This dates back to the Bible and is not a new concept. And what happens in the biblical text is not only that people are willing to argue with each other, but there are several characters, several of our mythic ancestors who are willing to argue with God. And I have to say, when I read those stories, I always admire that our, our tradition preserves these texts of people who are willing to stand up to the authority in their day. The first person to stand up and speak out against God was Cain, very early in the book of Genesis, but his argument was entirely self-serving. A few chapters later in Genesis, we encounter Abraham. What's remarkable about Abraham is that his argument is not self-serving, and it's not even just on behalf of the Israelite people. He argues on behalf of the innocent people of the cities of Saddam and Gomorrah. Of course, when we talk about innocent suffering and speaking out against God, the perhaps most well-known example of this, the guy who has an entire book dedicated to him in the Bible, is Job. He's suffering, he's a good guy, and he speaks out in anger and frustration to God, why are you making these bad things happen to me? Today's confrontation with God will be brought to us by Moses. And the question that I'm going to ask is just how confrontational was Moses actually? And the answer is, I have no idea. <laughs> and the reason is because all I have is the text that's on this scroll. I have had this experience, and perhaps some of you have, where you've gotten an email, or I imagine back in the day this is what happened with letters. And I've tried to understand that was from your generation. <laughs> what, what's an email again? What's an email, he says. Um, so if you've gotten an email and you've wondered, what is this person really trying to say? Right? When you have a conversation with someone, you have body language, you have facial, facial uh, expressions, you can hear the inflection in their voice. But when you have an email or words on a scroll like this, it's hard to understand the emotion behind it. So sometimes we wonder, even if there's an emoticon smiley face, like, was this person being sarcastic? Are they serious? Were they mad at me? Were they joking? Do I need to apologize? I don't really know what's going on. And that is pretty much what happens when we look at this text. And so I am going to continue reading the golden calf story, which we started reading last week. I'm actually going to pick up a couple of verses after where Bob left off. So what has happened at this point in the story is that the Israelites are down below with Aaron. They have made the golden calf. God is really, really mad, and he tells Moses to go down the mountain. Once I read the text, I'm going to try to answer this question. Was Moses obedient or was Moses confrontational? I'm going to take you all on this very long journey with me to figure this out. You don't really have a choice. And the crazy part is, at the end of the day, do I care whether Moses was obedient or confrontational? Absolutely not. So why am I spending so much time of all of our collective time on this? And there are two answers. One is that anyone who tells you that they know what the Torah says, they tell you they know the authentic, authoritative reading of this document is full of baloney. If someone said that to me, I would ask them to see their time machine because we would need to travel back to talk to the biblical authors. And we couldn't even just stop at one moment, because of course, this text was written over the course of many generations by many people, and then editors who came along later and added their spin to it. So it is so important to remember, this is a pretty innocuous conversation. It's a story with God and Moses having a talk. And even this, there are so many ways to read it. And so it is so important that we remember to resist fundamentalist readings of the text and to remember that there is a tremendous amount of nuance and a tremendous amount of information that we simply don't have and will never have about what the original intent of the document is. The other reason that I do this is because I'm going to show various commentaries over time that have dealt with this issue. And one of the beautiful things about Judaism is that it preserves all of those voices. It doesn't just say Moses was confrontational and here are all the parts of tradition that say it. It preserves the disagreement. Within books, it shows a confrontational Moses and an obedient Moses. This is an awesome thing about the Jewish tradition. It preserves debate. 
it preserves argument, and it says there are lots of different ways to look at things. And I think that that makes tech study more interesting, but it's also something we celebrate because it also means the Jewish experience is more interesting when we have a multiplicity and diversity of voices. So with that, I will start actually reading the text. Vayomer Adonai al Moshe, God spoke to Moses, Ra'iti et ha'am haza, I have seen this people, Vahine am kashe orafu, and behold, it is a stiff necked people. Not a nice compliment, although I will say there are multiple ways to read it. There are some rabbis who say stiff necked is actually a compliment. It means that they were forward thinking and able to stick to their path. But I can tell you at least this much God is mad. He doesn't like the Israelites. He thinks they're stubborn that they've made this calf. And there are two important words here. He says, this people. At other points in the text, God refers to the Israelites as my people. But here, he doesn't want to claim ownership. Some of you may have had this experience when you were a child. When you came home with straight A's and you were well behaved, your parents were like, that's my kid. That's mine, Johnny. And when you didn't do things so well, they're like, I've never seen that kid before, right? They don't even want to claim them. And the rabbis recognize this. They tell actually a very human story. They give a creative example. They say it's like a king who owned a vineyard. And the king had a tenant working his land. And when the tenant made wine that was delicious and wonderful, the king would say, I have the best vineyard. My vineyard is fantastic. And when the wine didn't taste good, the king would say, my tenant does a terrible job. And a friend of his said, you can't have it both ways. It's either your vineyard or it's not your vineyard. And so, so too with the Israelite people, perhaps the rabbis were saying, God, this is your people, whether they are well behaved or not. The Atah Hanichali, God says, now leave me alone. Vayichar api bahem so that my anger may blaze forth against them va'achalim, and I may consume them. But you, Moses, I'll make you into a great nation. Now what's going to happen is God has just said to Moses, leave me alone. And then Moses, this is your spoiler alert, in the next verse, Moses is going to speak out against God. So the question is, did God really mean what he said? Did God have the same commitment that we do at Congregation Beth Adam to saying what we mean and meaning what we say? And the rabbis ask this question because they say, why did God need to say, leave me alone? Nobody wasn't leaving him alone. He was delivering a monologue. Moses hadn't interrupted him. So he didn't need to say, leave me alone. So then they say, well, maybe he didn't really mean it. Right? We all do that sometimes. No, no, you don't really have to buy me a gift. But secretly, we might want it, right? So it's kind of like the book, Men Are From Mars, Women Are From Venus. In this case, it would be God is from Mars, Moses is from Venus. Maybe they weren't really communicating directly. The other thing is that if you look at the grammar of this sentence, it can be read in two entirely different ways. It can be a command where God is angry and says, leave me alone. And if that's what God said and meant as a command, then a Moses who speaks up against him is a pretty bold and audacious Moses. But the grammar can also lend itself to be read, if you leave me alone, then I'll be angry. And if that's the way that we understand that verse, it's basically an invitation for Moses to speak up to God. And so when he does, he's just doing exactly what God wanted. So then in the next verse, Vayachal Moshe et Panei Adonai Elohav, Moses implored Adonai his God, Vayomer Lama Adonai Yechare Abchab Amecha, why are you letting your anger blaze forth against your people? Asher Hotzeta Me Eretz Mitzrayim Bechag Gadol Uviyad Chazaka, whom you brought out of Egypt with great power and a strong hand. So here, the rabbis ask the question why does Moses mention Egypt? Right? If God is all knowing and God brought the Israelites to Egypt, and if God brought the Israelites out of Egypt in a text that uses words very sparingly, why mention Egypt? And they say that it was Moses' subtle way of actually putting some blame back on God. Because in Egypt, people worshipped lambs. So if that's what was happening in Egypt, then of course the Israelites would want to come home and worship an animal. Don't you see that, God? You set them up for this. 
And again, the rabbis are very creative. So they tell a story and they say that it's just like a guy who opens a perfume shop and he opens it on a street that is frequented by prostitutes. And he asks his son to run the store for him. And the son falls into some habits that the father is not particularly pleased with. And the father says, I'm going to kill my son. I can't believe he's become such a bad person who does such terrible things. And a friend of the father says to him, you can't do that. You put him in this position. You could have opened a different kind of store, given him a job more befitting of a nice Jewish boy. But instead, you opened a perfume shop on a street frequented by prostitutes. What were you expecting? So he puts blame back on them. So perhaps Moses is subtly blaming God here. Lama Yomru meets Ryan Lemore. Why would you let the Egyptians say, Moses is saying to God, why would you let the Egyptians say that it was for evil purposes that you took the Israelites out only to kill them in the mountains and wipe them off the face of the earth? Turn from your evil ways and renounce the punishment you were going to do for your people. So now Moses is going to take a different tactic. He's basically saying, God, what will the neighbors think? <laughs> right? This is an interesting verse because it suggests two things. It suggests that God has a reputation. We don't want the Egyptians to think poorly of you, God. But it also suggests that God cares about his reputation. A very interesting God concept. There's a gajillion God concepts captured in this text. Earlier, you may have heard me say God brought them out with a strong hand, very anthropomorphic. But here, a God with a reputation who cares about his reputation, a really fascinating way of looking at this. Moses continues, Zechor la Abraham la Yitzchak la Yisrael abdecha. Remember Abraham and Isaac and Israel, Jacob, your servants. Asher nishbata lehem bach, whom you swore to them. V'tedaber aleihem, you said to them, Arbe azarachem chachuchavei hashamayim. You told them that you would multiply their seed like the stars in the sky. V'chol ha'aretz hazot hasher amarti aten. And all of this land which I spoke of, which I um, spoke of, a ten lazarachem v'nachlu le'olam, I will give to them. So now, Moses is taking another tactic. Essentially, this is a prayer that Moses has been offering in these verses. He's trying to convince God, don't hurt the people. And here, he does something different. He does something that's still done traditionally in Jewish prayer today. He says, eh, the people of this generation, we might have messed up. But our ancestors... They were really good guys. It's called the merit of the ancestors, right? He says, if you don't do it for us, that's fine, but do it for them. You made them this promise that we would be as numerous as the stars and as the sands on the sea. You don't want to mess this up, God. So Moses is getting pretty creative in his arguments here. And sure enough, God turned from the evil and renounced the punishment that he was going to do to the people. So Moses has been tremendously successful. So now that we've read this, I want to do what I said I was going to do earlier and talk about how we can view Moses' role in this story. You can see a lot of it hinges on the verse before he speaks up. Did God say, leave me alone, and then he boldly confronted him, or God invited him to speak to him, and Moses just did what God wanted? Moses is seen as a prophet par excellence throughout the Jewish tradition. And a lot of that is because of his ability to balance his relationship to God and to the Israelites. So in looking at this text, I'm not just going to expound on my ideas. I'm going to look in three places. I'm going to look first using intertextuality, which means I'm going to look elsewhere in the Torah and the rest of the Bible to see if there's anything that sheds light on this story. Then I'm going to look at some of the earliest translations, maybe written only a few hundred years after the Torah was canonized. The reason that we do that is because Translation is not a science. It is very much an art. It is an act of interpretation. And so that can shed light on how those translators viewed this text. And the third area that we can look are commentaries and rabbinic madrashim. How do the rabbis view this text? So what I'm going to do first is present to you a confrontational and defiant Moses. Okay? So, and I could end the story there if I wanted, but then I'm going to do the other side to prove my point. So... The first place I look is elsewhere in the Bible. If we turn to the book of Psalms, in Psalm 106, 
It recounts the sins that the Israelites have committed. Well, if you're talking about sins that the Israelites have committed, you are definitely going to talk about this golden calf sin. It was a very big deal. And so there, as they reference the golden calf incident, they said that Moses stood in the breach. Peretz is the Hebrew word, a very warlike, confrontational Moses, and that he stood in that place like a warrior. Of course, if I hadn't read Exodus 32, I wouldn't really know what they were talking about in Psalm 106. And if I only read Exodus 32, I wouldn't have that layer of nuance added from the Psalms. So this text talks to itself within itself. As I mentioned, we can also look at the translations. A lot of the earliest translations are pretty loyal to the text, especially this part of the story. So they retain the ambiguity. The Samaritan Targum, the um, Syriac Peshitta, they wouldn't tell us anything more than this text would tell us. But there is one translation, the Vulgate, which is written in Latin, which shows no ambiguity in what's happening here. When God speaks to Moses, it is clearly an imperative. It is a command, do not bother me, leave me alone. And then in the next verse, when Moses speaks up, that translation adds a word. It says, however, Moses talked to God. So there the point is very clearly that translator says, I know God was mad and I know that Moses was bold. The third place we can look are at some of the rabbinic commentaries, the Midrashim and other places where the rabbis take their view on this story. And sometimes they do it very, in very basic words, but sometimes they tell a story. And they do that here when they're talking about the golden calf incident. They describe Moses as holding on to God's clothing. It's as if he's holding on to him. He is, as they say, holding on to his shirt, perhaps, holding him, saying, I will not let you go until you promise not to punish the people. So they give, again, a very anthropomorphic God and a very angry Moses who's willing to grab onto God to get him to change his mind. The rabbis elsewhere also ask the question, why did it take Moses so long to go down the mountain? There are eight verses between when God tells Moses to go down and when he's actually down witnessing what's happened. So they come up with a story. It's not anywhere in the Torah, but they say there were five angels of destruction who Moses encountered, angry angels. Angels aren't always good, I guess, in the eyes of our tradition. And so God handles one of them. Each of the three patriarchs handles another. And that leaves Moses to handle one of these angry angels. And he takes up arms and fights against him. A very confrontational Moses. And lastly, the rabbis do the same thing that I did. They look at Psalm 106, and they use that as evidence to show that Moses was confrontational and defiant. And they actually group him there with Daniel, another character in the Bible who they say is confrontational as well. So if the point that I wanted to prove today was that Moses was confrontational, I just did it, right? Anybody can make any point they want from this text, and all the more so they can pull out generations of tradition. It's not just me saying it, it's all these brilliant rabbis. Guys, hundreds and thousands of years ago said this stuff. That's it, that's the end of the story. But that's not how we do it at Beth Adam. We like to tell the other side of the story too. And so now I'm gonna switch gears and make a case for Moses being entirely obedient. So first I'm gonna to turn to the Psalms again, to Psalm 99. This is an enthronement Psalm that praises those who intercede on behalf of the people. And there it praises Moses for interceding and calls him a counselor and advisor of God. I'm also gonna look in another place in the Torah. I'm gonna to look in the book of Deuteronomy because Deuteronomy is Moses' retelling of the book of Exodus. And when he retells the golden calf story, he doesn't respond right away to God in his version of the events. Instead, God is angry, and Moses does this thing where he just sits around for 40 days and 40 nights praying and fasting. So if any of you have chosen to fast and you think one day is difficult, imagine 40 days on this mountain. But that's a very different Moses. It's only when he goes down the mountain and sees what's happened that he even speaks out in anger. So this is a prayerful Moses. This is a passive, fasting Moses who waits before he speaks up. Very different than a Moses who grabs on to God's shirt. We can also look at the different translations. The Targum Unculus, which is an Aramaic translation, continues that idea that Moses was praying, just like in the book of Deuteronomy, and emphasizes that as well. We can look at some of the early biblical commentators, like Philo, who lived in Alexandria from 50 BCE to 25 CE. Philo liked to write about Moses. He liked to show the internal states of his characters, and he liked to praise Moses. 
in part because he knew how history was going to play out. He knew that the Levites were going to be an important people, and Moses was a Levite. So Philo really wanted to make sure that Moses looked good. So in his version of the events, God never even says, leave me alone. That whole part is left out. So when Moses speaks up, that's totally okay because nobody has told him not to. And he uses words to describe Moses. Philo says that Moses, Moses was a mediator and reconciler and one who prayed and made supplications. Then finally, if we go to the rabbinic texts on this side, just like we did on the other side, they tell another story. They say that a king is alone in a chamber with his son and he's strangling him. He's so angry at him. And the king is yelling, leave me alone so that I can kill him. And at that moment, the boy's tutor walks by and hears this. And he thinks, it's just the two of them in that room. So who could the king possibly be talking to? Right? He's talking about his son in the third person. He's more powerful than him. He's not talking to his son. He's not talking to anyone else. But he's saying, leave me alone. Oh, I know. He must not mean it. He must want me to go in there and stop him. And so that's what the tutor does. And the rabbis say that's what the king wanted. And so that the tutor really became a partner to the king in that story. The same idea as I was saying earlier, why did, Moses, why did God say leave me alone when nobody was bothering him? Maybe he really was inviting Moses to speak up. Rashi, a much later biblical commentator, makes that same point, although he doesn't use the parable. Finally, another place to look in the rabbinic text is one that deals with something else that happens in the Torah. About 10 chapters before where we are now, God said in Exodus 22, that he would destroy, he would wipe out any people who sacrifice to other gods. Well, now God has a problem because that's exactly what the Israelites want to do. So Moses becomes incredibly helpful to God in the rabbi's version of this story. Moses puts on a cloak and he sits there like he's a sage and God comes to him and God is regretting what he said. He's regretting that he might have to hurt the people. And Moses says, it's okay. I'll absolve you of this. I will annul your vow for you. A real role reversal where Moses plays the role of someone who can help God and really change him from bringing these traumatic, drastic consequences upon the people. So now I've made the case for a completely obedient Moses. And I could have done that without telling you any of the other side of the story. In both cases, I am backed up by what the Torah says. I am backed up by what the tradition says. And I could say that that is what the text wanted. But I don't think it is. I think that the text lends itself to be unraveled and to be seen in different ways. The good news for all of you is that I'm not going to test you on any of this and say, what did this Targum say? And what did that rabbi say? Right? That wasn't the point of this. The point was to say, all of the, this is preserved within our tradition. Our Judaism celebrates preserving debate and dialogue and discussion and thought and all of this energy that we bring to text, it celebrates. And I think that that is a remarkable thing about Judaism. Because text study is far more interesting when we look at different perspectives. But the Jewish community is also a lot more interesting when we continue that debate, that thoughtfulness, that willing to willingness to have multiple voices around the table. And that is something that we continue to celebrate today. Thank you.